Okay, we're on. First of all, for all you guys who are coming to class in person, I appreciate you coming on time. I appreciate that. But if you got to come late, that's fine. But it's much better, obviously, if you don't disrupt the class. Um, I'm not going to review last class because we covered I like a lot of stuff. <laughs> and if I reviewed what we covered last class, I missed half this class. So rather than reviewing, do you guys have any comments or questions about the subjects that we covered that you can think of off the top of your head? You guys any questions or comments? What we talked about? Nothing? Okay. One of the things we talked about last week was culture. Right? And it, again, this is this is got to marketing culture. We talked a lot about business culture and company cultures last session. Yesterday I'm having lunch with my nephew. Just I told you took that job at Dark Trace. So I said, uh, we're talking about a bunch of stuff. And I said, what'd you take the job for? Why do you, you like about the job? Because I think I'm gonna like the culture. My ears picked up. He's only 25 years old. I didn't say anything. So I said, what do you mean? He says, Well, they're, they let you do your own thing. You have to work hard. They don't micromanage. You can make good money. You have to problem solve. You have to have a lot of skills in a lot of different areas. So what does that sound? He's not here. Who's major in entrepreneurship? Anybody major in entrepreneurship? Oh, wow. You should have several number class. So an entrepreneur, that's like, that's like the definition of an entrepreneur. It, 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 like I'm not really good at entrepreneur. My brother is good at a lot of different things. I'm not. I suck at most things, and I'm good at a couple of things. <laughs> Pretty good at a couple of things, but an entrepreneur has to be good in a lot of things. So I thought that was wild. I didn't say anything because we had just talked about culture of the company the night before. So that's interesting. So I said, uh, well, "What did they ask you on the interview?" And he went through some stuff, and I said, "What did you ask him? What did you ask your boss?" And the boss is a is that she, I said, I think it's in the last class, there's two females and a male. And one of the females said, uh, what is, is he, he, the question was, what's your main role as a manager at, at uh, uh, Dark Trace? And she said to, pro, pro, to protect the culture. That was her answer. Not managing, not developing people, not making a lot of money, not making a lot of sales. Protect the culture. So that culture, which I thought was off the charts, because that tells you when you go interview for a company like that, how ingrained that mentality is. That, that manager is doing everything they freaking can to make sure that culture stays in there. And not everybody is cut out for a culture like that. Not everybody likes, you know, like my daughter would be terrible in a culture like that, for instance. You know, my daughter needs process. She's an unbelievably hard worker, but she needs process. She needs to be um, not micromanaged, but managed. You know, so she'd be terrible in a company like that. So when you talk about company culture, even though he's 25 years old, he was tuned into that already. I think it's a little early, personally, like I told you guys. But anyway, I just thought it was ironic. We talked about the subject. And the next day, I'm talking about to my nephew. And he's interviewing with a company with a, with a manager that says the most important job they've got is to protect the culture. That's pretty strong. So if you get to an interview situation in a company, that's something to think about. Okay, so today, we're going to cover what we were supposed to cover last month with Monday and start on some stuff that we were going to talk about today. I wanted to cut a bunch of slides out this afternoon to try to catch up and I couldn't do it. So I didn't do it. So we're going to go through the slides as they are in the, uh, cause I think it's something important about all of them. So remember we talked about macroeconomic factors, culture, demographic, social technology, economic, political, legal, and we're going to talk about all of these for the next 15 or 20 minutes, okay? So those are the men. Again, this is the consumer. Let's start again. This is the consumer, or it doesn't matter whether it's a consumer or a customer. We talked about these three things that are close to them, but all this other stuff, you know, impacts what people do in terms of how they, how they are marketed to and how they make decisions on buying. And when you're a marketer, you got, you got, to, you got to figure all that out. We talked about country, we did talk about this. We talked about country culture and regional culture. I remember we talked about that, so I'm not gonna go through that again. Demographics, we didn't talk about demographics. So demographics provides an easily understood snapshot of who the people are. Marketers use data about shoppers to target, use data about shoppers to target offers. 
what the hell is a demographic? Have you guys ever heard of that? You guys, who's heard of that? Demographic? Come on, man. Who, who's heard of demographic? Don't be falling asleep on me. I'm going to start picking people out. What do you got, what do you got for demographic? Okay. So it's stuff you can mostly see. So demographics is what everybody thinks marketers do, right? They break demographics into this dude here, white male in his 20s uh, from Atlanta, and he makes $35,000 a year, right? That's whatever it is. I'm just making it up. That's a black guy in his 30s. In his 30s, and he's got a job. He's making so much a year. He's from New York City and moved down to Atlanta. You know, and he's uh, and he's go he's a junior in college. His kids are so freshmen. That's all demographics. And historically, that's how people marketed. And we're going to talk a lot about that in about ten minutes. Historically, people marketed against demographic or companies marketed against demographics because it's easy. Like it says, it's easily understood, and it's stuff mostly you can see and measure. We're going to talk about something that's almost a complete opposite of that in a minute. But that's demographics. That obviously um, that if that influences. <laughs> what people buy and how they look at buying. Definitely wanted to talk about this chart. I, you know, so I'm, I'm 65 years old. So that makes me, and you guys probably can't see it. I don't know if you're in your computer, but they've got generations here, generation Z, Y, X, baby boomers. And a lot of people have heard of that stuff, but really nobody knows what it means. A lot of people don't know what it means. So baby boomers are old people, right? Like me. So baby boomers, I was born in 1955. I'm right in the middle of baby boomer generation. So 19, if you're born in 1946 and 1964, you're a baby boomer, right? You're Gen X if you're born between 1965 and 1976. You're Gen Y if 1977 to 2000. And then you got Gen Z, 2001 to 2014. Who cares? Who cares? Why is that, why is that even, why is that? Why is that important? Why do you think marketers care, ma'am, about that stuff? Okay, so technology is a big thing. Who watches TV? Has anybody watched? I mean, I watch. I don't know how much you guys watch TV. Have you seen the progressive commercials? Does anybody know what the progressive commercials are? What do they do? Uh, that guy? You know that guy I'm talking about? Yeah. What's he doing? Uh, mm -mm. That's all stay. What does a progressive guy do, you guys? Have you seen him? It's almost worth going on YouTube. The commercials are freaking hilarious. Exactly. Right? The progressive commercial, if you haven't seen it, and you got 10 minutes tomorrow. Go on YouTube and look at a couple of progressive commercials. They have a whole campaign about this guy who supposedly is teaching young people not to act like their parents. And they pick on stuff like, I don't know about you guys. Like, if you come to my house, my wife's got 15 cushions on the sofa. You know, he talks about, that's the old school. People don't look at 15, you know, do stuff like that. Or they talk about, like, he's in a hardware store with a guy. And this guy's talking to somebody who's buying a hammer or something. And he goes up to him and says, no, he doesn't need your help. You know, he doesn't need your help. So it's, he's trying to talk about how not to act like your parents. So who the hell is he talking to? Who's that commercial talking to? What demographic? You guys. Right? That commercial is not for old people. I mean, he's making fun of us. That commercial is for young people. So when you talk about demographics and generations, there's massive gaps here. For instance, what do baby boomers have that you don't? What, what do you have? What do I have that you don't? No, well, kind of. Money. I got money. My generation has money. When you get to my age, you'll have money, hopefully, right? Well, how, when you market to somebody who's this generation, and what product do you market versus how you market to this? If you're a financial planner, right? 
if you're if you're if you're running a company or you're marketing through financial planning, some of you, most of you probably don't know what the hell financial planning is. So do you think the best place to advertise financial planning is on Instagram? No. They're gonna do more traditional media, right? They're gonna do magazines, they may do magazines, they might do direct mail, they do referrals, stuff like that. How you guys, and it's hard for me, I gotta be honest with you, because I'm getting more and more removed. It's funny because Generation Z and Generation Y, so Generation Y, what was this? This chart's like, I don't know how old this chart is. So 1977, how old would that be now? 25? No, 35. No, 2000, what the hell? 2000 is 21 years ago. So this is up to about 42 now, right? So say about 16 to 18 to 42. You guys, who in here is born back to 2001, 19, 19, 20 years. So we got people in here born there, right? 19, 20 year old people, yeah. This generation, Generation Z, supposedly the younger people do not like Generation Y. And there's a lot of reasons for that. These are called mostly millennials. Have you heard that term? Oh my God, right? Baby boomers, and I'm one of them, loves to bust the chops of millennials. When I'm with my son and his friends, it's merciless. Merciless. You know why? I'm jealous. Most baby boomers, they won't say it, I'll say it. I'm jealous because they're so smart. And I wasn't that smart at that age. But they're smart. Now, they, did we do the baseball analogy in this class yet? Did I talk about that yet? Okay, I'm preaching again. I'm off the reservation five minutes into the class. Look, I'm a big believer in this. This is like something, if you don't remember anything in this class, remember this. In this, remember this. this is probably the top five things I think I'll talk about in this class. Okay, so for you guys that are online, I'm drawing, I'm drawing a baseball diamond, right? So a baseball field, first, second, third, fourth base. First, second, third, home plate. My baseball player buddy back there, he gets this, right? So here's a diamond. First, second, third, fourth. Here's what baby boomers have a problem with. And I, want, I really want you guys to try to take I guarantee you a couple of this is going to resonate with people. Try to pay attention. When I graduated, when I graduated college, we started, we started home, went to first base, second base, third base. To be a success to score, we had to round the bases. Now, success, what does success mean? A lot of you want to make a lot of money. Some of you maybe don't want to make a lot of money. Success is individual success, right? Success can mean anything. Success is, you can make $45,000 a year running a nonprofit, and that's success. Or you could make $400,000 a year running a hedge fund, and that's success. It depends what you think success is. But I want you guys to please pay attention, because most of you are missing this. You love technology. Love it. Phones, computers. Oh, it's the greatest. Video games. All that shit. Awesome. The problem is most of you think that's the key to success. So what happens is you guys start on second base. I think I've said in this class, the average person in this class is a hell of a lot smarter than I was at your age. Not even close. The reason is because of, your, of computers, technology, you guys are so much smarter than our age, our age was, or my generation was at your age. So you start at second base. So in order for me to be successful as an old man, I want first, second, third, and fourth. And there's things called skills. And a lot of students don't understand this either. And I didn't either when I was in college. There's a difference between skills and education or knowledge. Anybody want to take a shot at that? What's the difference in education or knowledge and skill? Yes, sir. That's close. That's close. Are you gaining skills in this class? None. What are you gaining? Uh, education, knowledge, not skills. Skills, work ethic, analytical skills, interpersonal skills, creativity, problem solving, all that stuff. Okay. So you, I'm just going to pick on you since you're nice up here. 
say you're really good with computers. You probably are. Great with the internet, great with all this stuff. Like most people your generation. You start at second base. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Luckily, I brought my own marker. It's top-notch school, huh? I'm carrying batteries in here and everything. Pretty soon I'm going to have an overnight bag in there. Okay, so you start at second base because you're so knowledgeable with the internet and just, let's say, technology. So Steve or Joe or whoever it was, my generation, we started here, went here, went here, went here, went. Well, what skills are needed to score? Work ethic. What's work ethic? What's that mean, buddy? You know what that means? can't describe it, but I, I know what it means. You kind of know what it is? That's okay. Yeah. Anybody want to take a shot? What, you know, what's work ethic mean? No. No. Do you know what work ethic means, buddy? That's closer. Basically, work ethic means you work hard. Your know, work ethic means that you take shit seriously. What you said right there, I mean, you're, you're putting in the time and you're working hard. So that's what work ethic is. What's interpersonal skills? What's interpersonal skills? Now I communicate how you get, very good. Now how you communicate you get how you get along with other people, right? Interpersonal skills. How about uh, um, analytic skills? What's that mean? What's analytic skills? It's like numbers. What else is it, though? It's like numbers. That's right. What do you do with numbers, though? Yeah, well, no, well, it's understanding what numbers mean, right? And what does that have to do with your job or your life or whatever? What about problem solving? What is that? Problem solving skills. What do you think that means? Don't feel bad. I mean, again, I didn't know any of this stuff when I was in college. So this is like the Steve Flame. I'm getting on my soapbox. I just think this is like huge. Of course, it's my idea. Of course, it's huge. What's problem solving skills? Well, that's an example. But what does it mean to be a problem solver? Coming up with solutions. That's exactly right. So coming up with solutions. And I can name a bunch of these, right? So here's the problem with you guys, your generation, and, and, and up to maybe 35, 36 years old. You start here. But a lot of you think your phone, your laptop is a key to success. Your phone and your laptop is a tool. It ain't, now you could get lucky. You could develop an app and make a million bucks. That could happen. You know how many people make apps and make a million bucks? Not many. You know how many people are gonna have regular jobs? Almost everybody. So to have the technology skills is really huge, but your generation, a lot of you, I'm just being frank here, Think that this is like the means and end. This is it. So you stay at home six hours a day and play freaking video games, or you do stuff that's not that's not it's not developing these skills. And what happens is you start at second base, and you're 40 years old, and guess where you still are? Second base. <laughs> now, you guys have a monstrous advantage because if you are here with good technology. And, and you develop these skills? Uh-oh. This is like my son. I told you my son makes 400 grand a year. He's 32 years old. My son's very good technology, but he's a master on this stuff. So if you, and this people in the U class, in this class, again, you're way smarter than I was at your age. You're more smart than my, my generation was. Do not stop here. You have to, in your career or your school, in your personal life, all the stuff that made somebody a success 50 years ago is still what makes a success today. The only difference is you're starting ahead of everybody else. You have a tremendous advantage. For some of you guys, our studs are going to be really successful. And you're going to take the brains that you've got in technology and the skills you've got in technology and add this other stuff, and baby, you are going to be rocking. You are going to be rocking. So when we talk about these generations, there's gigantic gaps, not only in technology, but how much money people have, 
what their interests are, how religious they are, for instance. I go to Mass every day. I go to church every day. Anybody in here go to church every day? No, your generation doesn't do that. And guess what? I didn't do when I was in college either. As time goes on, you know, you may end up doing stuff that you feel like you probably should go to church every day when you get older. So you know, I'm trying to, so we're not going to go into that. But I mean, I do go to church. So you get older people are more religious. And I can go on and on and on. So these generational things are how marketers mark differently by generation. And what the messages in advertising and whatever, and what messages advertising they use, what color stuff are, what size they are, what price they are, is all broken up into these, you know, these, and they call it generational Y, but generation Y is pretty much millennial. That's more of a term you hear as millennial. Okay, any questions about that? Don't forget my baseball diamond. Hopefully two or three of you won't forget. I'm sure most of the class doesn't care, but hopefully two or three of you will care. Okay. Income, you guys know what income is. Middle class families feel the decline of purchasing power in recent years. You know, ah, oh shit, I forgot to do this. Ah, last class. So last class I did it, I, and, I, and I got the dollars, and I'm sorry, I forgot to do it this class. So what is middle, let's do this just in general. What does middle class mean to you guys? What's middle class? Average, right? So what do you think if, I don't kill him, I forgot the exact numbers. But when they say the middle class, have you heard like in the media or anything or on the internet, middle class is shrinking? What does that mean? What does that mean? Do you know what that means? What does that mean then? Yeah, what happens is, so like, let's take the stock market. So the stock market's gone through the roof, right? How many people in here own $100,000 worth of stock? You own 100000 worth of stock? Okay, that's one. Anybody else? So the stock market going through the roof, what's that do for you? Nothing. But if you've got a lot of money in stock, you start to grow, right? So the stock market goes up, you gain more and more money. What happens if you don't have any stock? You're stuck, you're stuck in the same place. So you have to find out how to, you have to find ways of making money someplace else. That's not always easy. So the poor in this country, most people stay poor. And, or if they lose their jobs or because of COVID, they may go from middle class to poor. But the people who are growing are the people with money. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase, you know, money makes money. You guys ever heard that term? <laughs> You know, it's hard to make the first $10,000. Once you make the first $10,000, it's easier to make the second $10,000. You know, it's hard. So this idea of middle class shrinking, which, you know, you can argue that's kind of political. I don't want to get too much into that because some people think that's BS. But this idea of middle class shrinking, it really doesn't matter. You've got, let's do this. You've got nine socioeconomic classes. Okay, you got lower, you got middle, and you got upper. Each of those classes are lower, middle, upper. Lower, up, mid, lower, middle, upper. Lower, middle, Upper. So marketers, from an income standpoint, break down classes into nine socioeconomic classes. So it's not enough to say you're middle class or lower class or upper class. They want to break down, let's just use middle class. The difference between lower middle class and upper middle class is gigantic. Gigantic in terms of how much money they've got, what money they spend, what products that they're attracted to. It's a big difference, even though they're so-called middle class. So marketers, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about a product like uh, ramen noodles, you guys know what ramen noodles is? Okay. How many people do you think in this socioeconomic class have had ramen noodles in the last year? You think a lot? Really? Why do you say that? No, no, buddy, upper. Uh, maybe I miscommunicated. So in the upper class, if you're a ramen noodle manufacturer, 
Are you marketing to people making half a million bucks a year? Not at all, right? So what do you market to? Lower. What about college kids? Right? Especially you guys, most of you guys probably live at home or I don't know if you're in dorms, but if you go to a school where people, you know, are, are not, that's, it's, it's, it's a school where most of the people are not commuters and they got dorms, that's who eats ramen noodles. You go to, you go to like Georgia, ramen noodles is probably the number one thing kids eat out there. Okay. So what product you got has to do in terms of who you market to. And I'm just telling you, when you, even up here, let's look at upper class. The difference between upper class upper upper class and a lower upper class is massive massive these dudes down here gates ellen musk billionaires whereas somebody who might have i'm gonna make this up if your net worth is maybe 10 million you might be considered middle class and if your net worth is i don't know maybe plus three or four million you'd be lower upper class Again, do you want to market to people who are billionaires the same way that you want to market to somebody who's got three to $4 million? Even though they're all upper class, they're completely different. So just remember, marketers market to nine different socioeconomic classes when it comes to income, okay? And income obviously is a bigger deal. I mean, you, you want, if people don't have money, you know, what are they, <laughs> tough, right? You've got a problem if you're marketing to people who don't have money unless you're marketing a commodity that they have to have. Education, higher the education for the most part, for the most part, and I have a soapbox on this, I'm not gonna get into it. For the most part, education is related to income, meaning the more educated you are, the better chance you have of making more money. Uh, you guys are all in college, and you're going through this BS at eight o'clock at night on a weekday, so I'm assuming you agree with that. Gender, male, you know, male, female. Marketing has changed to reflect these shifts. I'm going to talk about women here in a minute because I love women. Ethnicity, by 2050, minorities will represent 50% of the population. Okay. When I went to school, and I went to a good school in Chicago, the teacher stood up here and he looked in the classroom, and what did he see? What did he see? 80% white guys. Maybe maybe 5% black and about 15% women. Now what do I see? I'm standing up here. Name something. The only thing we don't have in this class, which I normally do is have older people. Usually there's a couple of people in their 50s or 60s that they don't, I don't think I've got that in this class. They might be online. But Jesus, we got different ages, sexes, people from outside the United States, inside the United States. I mean, color of hair, how much money you make, everything in the world. So think about if I'm selling a product 40 years ago when I went to school versus now, it's totally different. So I, I talk about, I'll get a little bit of soapbox right now. I talked about diversity, and I was joking with my friend here. He was early in the class. So there's racists in here, right? Definitely, without a doubt. There's racists in here. Could be black racists, don't like whites. Could be Mexican racists, because Mexicans hate Puerto Ricans. It could be uh, Jews who hate Christians or vice versa. It could be whites who hate blacks. Definitely, without a doubt, there's racism in here. Now, Steve was brought up because of my dad, a lot of it, is I don't have a racist bone in my body. When I was a cook, one of the departments they called was uh, the Rainbow Coalition. They called my department. Especially if you're black. Do you guys know what the Rainbow Coalition was? You know Jesse Jackson is. So Jesse Jackson is an activist who's been around for a long time. He's still living. That's what he called their, that's what they called his group. That's what they call my group at Coke. Okay. Because you can't answer. If I'm in business or I'm managing, what color is the only color that counts? Green. I don't give a shit if you're, I had Vietnamese, Thai, I have people from Pakistan, Blacks, Koreans, uh, all, all these people working for, I don't care. If you're a business guy, and I hope anybody in here is racist, I'm talking black, white, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're racist at all. Why would you be racist in business when that's going to retard your ability to make money and be successful? 
in my and again, it's the way I'm raised. My father, you know, rescued Jews in World War II, and yeah, I told you he was CIA. My father was freaking nuts, and he and he ingrained this idea of of everybody being equal. It, it's the mo the best part. I got to be honest with you. I was raised that way, and I try to be that way in business. If you want to be a success, you cannot have that stuff be biased. It's the same thing with women. This is, the, I'm so proud of a guy who worked for me. This, a guy who worked for me, Coke, who's still my friend. He worked for me in Indiana. I was running the Midwest back then. And he was working in Indiana and we were killing Pepsi, killing them. It was like, we should have been put to jail. It was unbelievable. And we were drinking all the time and, Final Fours and Mardi Gras and going to Europe, and it was just nuts, taking customers. So I, I, I came down to Atlanta, and he took my job in Chicago. And then about a couple of years ago, he came, after that, he came down to um, Atlanta, and he was responsible for Walgreens drugstores. You guys have seen Walgreens worldwide. He was responsible for worldwide for Coke to call him that customer. So he was making good money, very successful. We were like this. He weighed about 250 pounds. He uh, had uh, fat. He was fat. He was from the farms. And um, just a good old boy. So he calls me up and he says, I'm going to human, uh, HR. I go, you know what HR is, right? Human relations, right? At a cup, at Coke, I go, what do you mean you're going to HR? He says, I believe in this diversity thing. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He says, I think diversity is the future. Now, we, had, we were going through a black lawsuit at Coke, which I was part of. The black guys who worked for black, I mean, I had people work for, play for Dallas Cowboys work for me, for instance. And what happened was, and they were right, at Coke, the, the, there was a black lawsuit, and the blacks sued the company that they were not getting the right um, uh, chances for advancement. And they were absolutely right. Now, and I was one of the problems, even though I had a lot of blacks working for me, when you're, and I'm telling you, I don't have a racist bone in my body, honest to God, but when you're hiring somebody, if this dude right here is from Chicago, he likes sports, he likes to drink, back then it was important. His wife was really, uh, spouses were a big thing at Coke, so his wife was cool. He had a good background, blah, blah, blah. He, it's, he identified with me, I identified with him, it wasn't that I was against you. It was this guy I identified more with. And, he, and I had a lot of blacks working for me. But in my mind, it was easier to identify with him. So I didn't have anything against you. It was that it was easier for me to identify with him. But over the years at Coke and at most companies, that shit added up. And what happened was there was no blacks. And this is a black thing. I'm going to talk about women here in a minute. But my buddy. But there's the, the, there was no blacks. So they, they sued us. And there were people who worked for me part of the lawsuit, so I was part of it. And I, you know, I, was, I, I totally understood blah, blah, blah. So Jeff goes into HR, and he's in the middle of this thing. He's a white guy, fat white guy. So what does he do? He loses 50 pounds. He grows a ponytail, puts two earrings in, and only wears black. Now, Coke, outside Coke, was the wild, wild west. Inside Coke, very, 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 very conservative company. Very, very. But what was he saying? He was a walking example of diversity. So over the years, now Jeff has lectured to my class. So Jeff ended up being a teacher at Emory, uh, like me. Um, and he's, he, 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 he gravitated, because I'm getting into women now, which is part of my, you know, that's not considered... So when they say by 2050, minorities represent 50% of the women, or 50% of the population, that doesn't include women, right? Women are already over 50% of the population, which we'll talk about women in a minute here. He became an expert on women, and actually, I'm kind of an expert on women. Now, not sexual harassment, even though I was at the first sexual harassment class at Coke, which was another whole other story, but we talked about women in terms of how important, it's, how important it is to have women in business. Because that lady right there is a hell of a lot different than you. She has a lot more positives. I shouldn't say more. She has a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. So what happens is I loved women. I loved women, especially single women. Because if they came to work for me, what were they? They got a kid at home, let's say. 
and they come work for me, what are they most worried about? And, and losing their job. So those women worked their, the women that worked for me worked their, they, I really, I, I'm not bullshit. I, I tried to treat them well. I was very, and I'm really getting off the res. Two years ago, this guy meets this woman from Coke who I hadn't seen in 20 years. So they start talking about Coke people and my name comes up. And this woman says, oh my God, I love Steve. Now I gotta be honest with you, I hardly, I don't even remember this one. But she's telling this guy I know that she loved me. And I said, why did she love me? Because I held the meeting once and I let her bring her kid. And she just thought that was the greatest thing since life. It's 20 years later she's talking about it. So a woman, if you can get close to her and she gets close to you from a business standpoint, there's so many benefits. So this, it's not with the Barclays Bank. Barclays is, I don't know, top 10 bank in the country. And we met with the top, me and Jeff met with the top, I mean, we did seminars because what happens is at Barclays and most companies, they hire 50% women and 50% men. It's, the hiring is not the problem. So at Barclays, there's 13 levels between the CEO and the entry level job. They were hiring 50% women, right? But every level, 50%, 55% men, 60% men, 70%. By the time you got to the top, there was one woman on the board. So their problem, and most companies' problem, is not hiring women. That's not the problem. The problem is once they get in there, they don't treat them the right way. And people don't, especially white guys or any guys, don't realize how women think and what's important to them and blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. You know, patience, there's so many positives about women over men. But there's negatives, too. So you need to handle it. So the one thing I'm going to say, so this guy's an expert on women, and he comes and lectures to my class. I'm not going to have him lecture this semester because, and it's fascinating shit. I'm telling you, blow your mind. What he's, what he, it's all factual stuff. Again, no sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is a subjective thing. So if you do something, harass her. You may not think it's harassment. She thinks it is. Or, or I think it's harassment. So sexual harassment claims, one out of three sexual harassment claims are made by a third party. They're not even made by one of the people involved. So it's all subjective. The stuff we're talking about is objective, right? So how important is to have a woman? So he comes and talks every class. We went to Barclays Bank last year and met with their, you know, all, all the people at the top. And that's why I know about the Barclay Bank numbers. It's like, well, dude, how come you're hiring 50% women, but there's no women at the top? So I can't, I, I'm not, it's not fair for him to come talk. I don't want him to come talk to class with a stupid shield on her. I'm not going to have him do that. But the ability for minorities to market to minorities, and we talked last week about ethnic sections, for instance, in supermarkets are something that was never there. So we're marketing the Koreans, we're marketing the Mexicans, we're marketing the Italians, we're marketing whoever it is to buy that product. Now, one last comment. You're a white guy, what's this mean? What's this, you talk, you, what, what do you think if you're a white guy and you hear shit like that? Is that good or bad? Bad. How do you make it really good? You know how you make it really good? Figuring it out. A lot of white guys in this class, a lot of white clients in student hiring, they're going to be left in the dust, man. Because guess what? This is happening. This is, you know, this is not like subject, this is not like we're projecting or this is going to happen. So if you're a white guy and you cannot manage minorities, if you don't understand minorities, if you come to the job with racial bias or sex, gender bias, you're in trouble. Now, if you're a white guy and figures it out, oh. Now you're going to, it's sort of like my diamond thing. If you're a white guy who can figure it out, you're going to hit a home run. So you guys, as you get older, you're going to, you're going to be in the middle of it. All you guys are going to be in the middle of it. You're going to have to change your, not change, how, how you manage things. And it's easier for your generation than my generation. Because like, like I said, when I went to school, everybody was white. So it's easier because you're used to having, a, you're used to having an environment like this. But when you get into business, sometimes people change. And I'm, I'm just telling you, especially for white guys, you could be left in the dust or you could be a superstar. So anyway, the idea about marketing to minorities is important. This chart says 30% will be Hispanic. You know, you guys are aware, even in Georgia, look what's happened just in Georgia about how the Hispanic growth. I told you guys about in LA, we had different, we talked about the last class about different Coke in LA. Yeah, we do a different Coke in LA because in Mexico, the Coke is sweeter. 
So we actually, in, excuse me, in Southern California, sell a different Coke because there's so many Mexicans there. They want their Coke sweeter. So Hispanics are going to have a whole bunch to say about what goes on in this country. Texas already, Arizona already, New Mexico, Nevada already, California is getting there. Hell, Georgia is getting there. So, I mean, Hispanics are going to be really important. So what does that mean when you're marketing to Hispanics? A great example is Prudential Insurance. I might talk about this later in class. I'll just give you real quick. Prudential Insurance for years showed a white family. Their commercial was the seagulls on the beach. Everybody's happy, blah, blah, blah. It's a white family. They got two dogs, and it was whatever the commercial was. Four years ago, you know what they changed to? Hispanic family in a house having a holiday dinner. You know what their business went through? The roof. Because if you're talking to Hispanics, they're not talking, they're not, they don't want to see golden retrievers on a beach. But what are Hispanics the most tuned into? Who's Hispanic in here? Anybody Hispanic? I don't see anybody Hispanic. Oh, that's a weird class. No old people know Hispanics. They're very unusual. Hispanics most important than Hispanics is family for the most part. So when you're advertising to Hispanics, you want to talk about family. So this whole idea about ethnicity and how people, how businesses market, this is just a massive, and it's, it's just going to get more and more and more important. And it's a challenge. Car dealerships, last comment, because this guy's got an unbelievable. Who buys more cars, women or men? Women. You know that? What percentage of car dealerships are owned by women? 10%. Why is that? Stuff like that. Here, I got a great one. I'm going to leave you with this. What, and I think it might be a slide coming up. What percentage of total dollars in the United States is either spent by a woman or heavily influenced by a woman? What that means is, say we're doing work in my bathroom at home, and my wife says, hey, Steve, go buy this towel rack and go buy this. Go buy. So that's, she's real, I'm buying it. But she's the one influencing it. Do you know what percentage of dollars women control in the United States? 80. 80% 80 of all dollars are either spent by women or are heavily influenced by men. But yet 10% of car dealerships are. I got a friend. He's a financial planner. You know what he does? He only talks to women. Widows. Because you know what? You're married to her. You, make a, you got a couple million bucks. He's your financial planner. Guess who he spends all his time with? You. You die. She's pissed off because the whole time he's been spending time with her. What does she do? She goes and finds another financial planner. My buddy, that's all he does. Widows who are pissed off because the old financial planner didn't pay attention to her. Smart, man. Yeah. My buddy? No, they're married. No, he's like, he's like 42 years old, regular married kids. And he's just identified. I'm telling the women thing. It, it, it just, it's just, I just wish, I wish he would come in, but I'm not going to make him come in. It's just fair. The stuff he's got is scary. I'm like a huge disciple. He used to work for me, but like I said, more and more friends now. A huge <laughs> disciple is health and wellness, social trends. So everybody's caring about health and wellness. Green, we've talked about. Privacy is a big deal with a lot of people. It's interesting. I have friends that this is like everything. To me, it's pretty much everything. The privacy becomes a bigger factor in marketers, especially when we start talking about social media. We're going to talk about privacy concerns and how some of social media is violating privacy of a lot of people. Uh, technology, we just talked about that. Okay, this is wild. For, and, I have, and I still don't really understand it, to be honest with you. I do know this. I'm at a party, and there's uh, – I'm at a party. I think I'd already left Co. And, and I'm at a party, and this kid's there. He's like 30 years old. And he works for Coke, and he's in the currency trading department of Coke. You guys know what currency trading is? What's currency trading, buddy? Well, it's not Bitcoin so much. It's like, that's true, but it's more even without Bitcoin, even without electronic currency. Regular currency is they're swapping pesos for yuan, from dollars to Australian dollars. They have a department that does that based on how the money fluctuates. Which, if you get into economics, you learn this stuff. I really don't understand it that much, to be honest with you. But, 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 twelve guys and, I, and women—I think they were in their twenties—were responsible for one third of Coke's growth because they traded the money at the right time. 
So if the dollar is going up, you know what it means? So the dollar is worth more money. They, these, I mean, these were geniuses, obviously. They're geniuses. And it's like they, they could figure that out. So what they did is they went and changed pesos that they got in Mexico, right? Or got in Bolivia or whatever the hell they got them and bought American dollars. So they got more value out of that. So according to them, and I have no reason to display, it was like 12, 12 people. You know, we had 50,000 employees or whatever. 12 people, he said, was responsible for a third of the growth. So this foreign currency fluctuation is huge, even to the fact that, like, if you deal with China, like, and now with COVID, if a dollar is worth, um, do you guys understand dollar? Do you guys understand what, like, do you like what dollars are worth and they fluctuate? Like, if you go to Mexico, you know, if the dollar's strong, that means you're, like, you go to Mexico, say, if the dollar's strong against a peso, then you can buy, you know, you know, a, a phone today is 100 pesos, but tomorrow it might be 90 pesos because the dollar is stronger. You guys got that? So this idea of, of, of currency fluctuations, a lot has to do with what happens if you sell something and it takes a year to deliver it. Say you're buying a product from China anywhere and you're not gonna get that product for a year. You have to think forward and say, wait a minute, if I'm, I'm let's say I'm only making 10% of the product, just for the hell of it. I make it 10% of the product, but what happens if the, the dollar changes 4% or 3%? That means I'm making 10% less or more, 3 or 4%. So this fluctuating currency has to do with how money changes, the worth, but also when you sell stuff that lasts a long, that doesn't get delivered in a long time, you have to think about, holy crap, you know, I got to make sure that if, if the dollar, for instance, goes down or it's going down, I actually have to raise my price. Because I've got to make sure that in a year I can cover my costs. So that's very complicated stuff. I mean, there's whole courses on that. It's interesting. I, I really don't understand it that well, to be honest with you. Enough to be dangerous, but certainly not enough to talk, knowledgeable enough to talk about it. Okay, any questions about that stuff? You guys all right? Any questions? Okay. I want to talk about segmentation. We're going to talk, this whole rest of this class and part of the next class is something called segmentation. All right. And, and I've touched a little bit on it on previous classes. So when we market the products to people, there's ways of thinking about how am I going to market my product? Am I going to segment it? Now, what, what the hell is segmenting? So segmenting, we just went through this whole demographic thing. And one way of segmenting it is demographics. And that's what this chart is showing. So they're, they're just talking about demographic. We're going to talk about something totally different here in a second. But this is, this is market segmentation based on demographics. So if I've got no market segmentation, I'm marketing to everybody. So you guys can't see, but there's a black guy, a black woman, a white woman, an older white woman, an Asian, a white prepster, and an older guy. So that's so you got whatever the product is. They're marketing to them the same way. What products, what products would do that? What products don't give a shit about who's in there? Can you think of any products? What? Water. That's not a bad one. What are you going to say, buddy? You said what? Oh, you said water. Okay, what, anybody over here say anything? It is decreasing. But what kind of products do you think are like that? I don't even know what water is. Yeah, you'll learn about this in this class. As time goes on, the idea about marketers, I said this, I think, the first class, is how do I market water to you versus differently to him? White guys in their 20s. We're going to talk about this in a second about the differences. So it's, it's an ex a little bit of an exaggeration because as time goes on, this becomes less and less. But like commodities, right? Water might be one. Commodities that are everybody uses. Toilet paper would be my big, that might be, that's, that's a real good one. Something that is a commodity everybody uses. You're not marketing, you're probably not marketing toilet paper that differently based on age, sex, religion, gender. What well, is sex? What I miss, income, whatever. You got it. So that's no market segmentation is when you don't cut up the pie. You know, the, here, here's the, the idea is you got a market of two, four, six, seven people. That's the whole market. And you got a product. If you have no market segmentation, you market to them all the same, all right? On the other hand, if you're fully segmented, what do you do? You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different marketing strategies. 
And that's where companies are today, are trying to get today. They want to market, we'll talk a lot about this as we go through class. They want to market to individuals. They don't want to market to groups because individuals have different things that they think are important. So the more we can deliver a message to an individual, the better you are going to be in terms of selling something. So the opposite of no market segmentation is fully marked, fully segmented. And then you've got differences right here. So this bottom for you guys who can't see, the market segmentation here is gender. So what we could do is we could take these three females, extract them from the four males, and say, I'm going to do marketing just to these three people. And there's a lot of reasons why you might do that. Obviously, if, you, if, you're, if you're marketing women's products or makeup, you, you know, we probably aren't the market. You know what I'm saying? So there's reasons to do it by gender. By here, it's by age group. We just got through talking about that with the different age groups. And what is this? By gender and age group. So here they split up. You know, it's like there's three women, but they split it in two because you got two older ones and one younger one. So the idea is you, can, you have to figure out how much you want to cut up the pie. How much do you want to split these seven people up or 70 or 7,000 or 7 million or whatever the hell it is to try to market your products or service? That's called segmentation. And it's like a basic thing in marketing. You guys cool? That's pretty simple to understand. Yeah. Okay. So how do I know, how do I know who to market to? You know, if I got a product and I'm coming out with, uh, if I'm coming out, okay, if I'm coming out with a canned liquor that, because I'm talking to these people tomorrow, a canned liquor company that is uh, no sugar added, it's drinks. It's four, it's four different drinks and cans. Okay. It's no sugar added. It's no, it's healthy, blah, blah, blah. They really don't have any competition. It's one of a kind. Um, and the company's like a year old. So let me think about that. So somebody like three or four years ago, probably over beers, comes up with this great idea. It's like, hey, let's market an alcohol and drink in a can that's healthy. Got it? Now, do I care about that? I'm not really. I don't really care about that. So they've got to look at, well, wait a minute, who does care about it? So I've got this idea, and believe me, there's a ton of ideas. Most ideas never make it to market because of one of these reasons. Let's say that most products do not make it to market. You'll, and I've got a million stories. I'm not going to bore you because I've told enough stories tonight about products that I invested in that did not make it to market, still aren't on the market. Because they missed one, of, they missed this stuff. So let's talk about this liquor in a can. It's a twelve, it's a twelve ounce can, regular can. It's a liquor. I, think, I don't know what I don't know. I'll find out tomorrow what the percent alcohol content is. But it's li it's a liquor drink, and they're drinks, but no sugar added. It's you know, it's it's not bad for you. So okay, they came up with this goofy idea. Well, the first thing they got to ask is that a substantial market? So what does that mean? If I come up with this product, it's healthy drinks in a can. Is there a big enough market for me to make money? Like, think about my water products. I, you know, I have to think about, well, geez, my product's a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche. Even if we get half of the market, is it big enough for us to have a business? So it's called substantiality. So substantiality, when you bring a product out or you're trying to identify a market that you're going to sell to, the market's got to be big enough to make sense. Right? That, you got that? The second thing is it identifiable and measurable. That means segments must be identifiable and their size measurable. So if I want to market a liquor drink, I'm just going to make this up, a liquor drink that's healthy to females between the ages of 21 and 40 that are college educated and live in urban areas. That's my market, just making that up. Well, the question is, can you identify women of that age and that education in an urban area? And can you measure whether it makes sense to sell to them or not? So the first thing is it's got to be big enough. And let's say in this case, they identify that is big enough. Then can they measure it and identify how to get to those people in, New, let's say, New York City? How do I get to a woman that fits that description in New York City? How do I market to them? The third thing is accessibility. And I like to, I'm going to go through with this. Accessibility. I'm in New York City. I'm a woman, college education, 21 to 40, um, whatever else I said, whatever else I said. 
demographically. Then the question is, oh, okay, that's great. They're big enough. I can identify them. I can measure them. But guess what? I can't get to them. I can't market to them. They, they won't listen to what I say. I, there's no way I could tell. I could get my message to them to buy this can of, of liquor drink, this drink that's healthy for you. So it's got to be big enough, identifiable, and measurable. You got to be able to reach them. And the last thing, which is the most important thing, is if you do all that shit and all that stuff is positive, are they going to buy it? So it doesn't do you any good to come out with a liquor, a healthy liquor drink in a can. Yeah, the market's big enough. Yeah, I can identify them and measure them. And yeah, I know how to market to them from these 10 different ways I can market. And you do all that and they don't buy the product. That doesn't do you any good. So when it comes to segmentation, you've got to feed, and this is a great chart because this is, this is pretty much, it's kind of simplistic, but it is the way it works in terms of new products or when products, we're going to talk about line extensions here in a couple of weeks about when products bring out other products, you know, to grow their business. You've got to be able to satisfy those four areas. Does that make sense? You guys cool on that? You guys awake today? Are we all right? Very dull class. Seriously, you guys okay? I'm all right if you're following me. I'll be pissed if you're not following me. Everybody cool? Okay. So that's criteria for segmentation. We're going to get a little funky now. So I think, was it you, sir? Somebody said over here, a basis for segmentation is geography. Right, so um, if I'm uh, make if I'm selling fresh flowers, what am I concerned about? If I'm selling them, exactly. So does that mean you think most of the flowers are either shipped in overnight and you pay a lot of money, or you got to get flowers that are grown close to you because otherwise they're going to go bad. Same thing with produce. Anything that's like it's going to go bad. So geography sometimes makes a difference in terms of how you segment what markets you're going to go to. Okay? That makes sense. Snow shovels. Anybody? Who's, who's the last person here who bought a snow shovel? So where do they sell snow shovels? In the north, right? So some of this stuff is common sense. If you're marketing snow shovels, why the hell would you run a promotional activity at Home Depot in Atlanta? You know? So anyway. So, so demographic we talk about, this is the complicated one. Psychographics, gold star. Who anybody's ever even heard of that? Anybody ever heard of psychographics? Yeah, pretty close. In terms of what, buddy? How you th think in terms of what? Ooh, you're getting close. Psychographics has got to do with. I'll pick on you since you're here. Where's a black female? We got black female in here. No black females. Okay. Uh, you got a white guy. You're a white guy. White. Let's just do the three of you. White guy, black guy, white female. Demographically, what do you have in common? Nothing. Nothing. Right? Different sex, different race, different everything. The other thing you have in common is maybe you're a college student. Okay. Psychographics is something relatively new that is way more powerful than demographics. What happens if you three are avid video players? You love video games. You play video games five, six hours a day, all three of you. Black guy, white woman, white guy. Marketers who are marketing stuff for video game players, who will they be marketing to? Video game players, not white guys, not white women, not black guys. They're marketing to people who share the same, what's called, I call it lifestyle. So on a test, I think if I ask this question, I might ask it this way. If psychographics has to do with lifestyles, if you're a mountain climber, if you're a sailor, if you're a hiker, if you're a reader, if you do pottery, it doesn't matter what it is, but you have a common bond with people that do that that's much greater than demographics, much greater. If you're all video game players, and you play with each other three times a week, and you drive a you you buy a Nissan Maxima, okay? You're gonna tell those people about the Nissan Maxima. They're gonna take your your uh, what's the word approval or what's the word recommendation. They're gonna take your recommendation on Nissan Maxima, 
he'll take it from you much greater than he'll take it from him. These are both white guys, same age, blah, blah, blah. That's all great. Nothing compared to the fact that you're a video game player. So this idea of getting into like psychographics is a big thing in marketing now. And a lot of companies are trying to do this. They're marketing products, not as much to demographics like, or like we just talked about, but I want to talk lifestyles, I think is a really good word. What are you doing in your life to make you a, a, with a bond with other people? You guys got that? Kind of a complex subject, actually. Do you guys have it? Because I don't know if I explained it that well. Yes, sir. Okay, great question. The deeper you're into it with her, right, and him, how much, the deeper you are, what's the chances of them agreeing with what you say? Hi. So the deeper you are, man, the deeper you are, the better it is for a product who can break into you guys. If, they're just, if you just talk to, if they're video game players and you talk to them once every two months and, you know, you barely know them, and you can say, well, so that's okay, but it's nowhere near as if you're talking to them like three times a week and, you know, your buddies and all that. And you say, you know what? I just bought a Maxima. That car is awesome. Whoa! Nissan has hit the mother load. Okay. So did that answer your question? What? Yes, ma'am. Is an example of this, like, you know how a lot of celebrities, like the Jenners and stuff, will like post like a marketing thing for like fit tea or something and then a bunch of their followers and stuff will go buy it just because they follow that person they like that person is that like is that related to this we're going to talk all about that but it's not so that's got to do with something called q scores and celebrities i don't want to get into it now because i'll talk a lot about it but that's more advertising okay. and and how you advertise and the power of like social media people okay. and celebrities we'll talk about that sports people okay. all that or you know models of the kardashians for instance right so, but that's not necessarily this. This has got to do with lifestyle. Okay. Now, now, to just kind of exaggerate, like my daughter, you know, you, know what a, you know what Bravo is? Part of it is because she's in movies, but you know Bravo is a TV station? It's all this, like, under deck, that goofy show that, that you know, follows a crew of people on yachts and the Kardashians, all these goofy shows, like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. She loves those shows. She's 31 years old. So I could exaggerate a little bit by saying, it, and she does have a lot of friends who are the same way she is. If they crack it, that's a lifestyle. So they like the Bravo program, but it's not necessarily because of the Kardashians. It's because they like the idea of the whole celebrity thing and it's just what well, she's into it. So we'll get to your point a lot, though, Donna Roll. Hey, you guys, I understand, you guys understand psychographics? Because I have a point, because I'll talk about it a lot in this class. Yes, sir. Right, right. So I, that was his question. So my answer would be is if somebody is, you know, a base jumper is? They're nuts. You know, the guys who jump off the top building, my, my buddy's son has got hurt unbelievably bad. He doesn't do it anymore. But he used to be a big base jumper. So it's, so they're, they're crazy, right? So they're really into it. It's, it's what they, it's, this kid, that's all he did, really. So there's a big difference between that and somebody who's interested in base jumping has heard about it. So the more you're into it, and as a marketer, if you can, the more you're into it, like that group of video games, those three people there, if they're really into video games, the more they're into it, when she says something about a product, the other two people are going to listen more. And if they're just interested, it's like, okay, but it's not as powerful. Is that what, because that's what he asked. Is that what you're asking too? Mm. I, I think... I don't know. I mean, it's a subjective line. I think if, if you're really into hiking, it's something like what, what I'll do is what, what are you into? Are you into like, okay. So lifestyle, I call it lifestyle it might be an exaggerated term, but that's a great example of somebody who likes the outdoors. Okay. In the old days, what you know, Camelback is, What's Camelback? Tell the class what Camelback does. Exactly. In the old days, you know how Camelback would advertise? 
they'd advertise in some magazine or USA Today or whatever. Now they're, they're advertising in a magazine or on the internet, on blogs, right? Or podcasts. The other guy I had in here a year ago was fascinating. He sold, he did podcast advertising. So to me, I don't understand why everybody doesn't do that. If I'm on a podcast that talks to people who are hiking and outdoors and I have that product, why the hell wouldn't I advertise there rather than someplace where there's a million people listening to my ad, but 3% of them are outdoorsmen. Like that, me, I'm not a camp. I don't do anything outdoors. I'm a city guy, right? So why would they advertise for me? You know, why would you do radio or TV or magazines or even on the internet unless you can target people? So when I say lifestyle, I guess the answer, it, it's just got to be a big enough thing that you, you identify with a group. And you do identify a group. It sounds like you may too. I don't know what the group is, but you, you identify, you, if you take it seriously. And if you take it seriously, lifestyle might be a, a little bit of an exaggeration, but that's the best term I can come up with in terms of trying to identify. That's a great question, though. Great. Because lifestyle is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. That, that's what I call it. So in this class, if I called it, then it's the way it is. You understand. Very good. You guys got psychographics? My man in the corner? How's your first class going? Are you happy you came? All right. Okay, anything else? Okay, good. So what else we got? Benefits sought. Benefits sought, it's, it's a... You can segment your 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 um, your market on something called benefit sought. Kind of a stupid term. But basically, benefit sought is that you buy a product, the same product for different reasons. So if I'm marketing a um, uh, my LED, my I'll give you my LED stuff. Right, I talked about this company. So I got three different. I'm minor owner of three different little companies. And the one company, it, 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 it replaces regular lights with LED lights in commercial buildings. And I just met with somebody today for lunch, and we talked about selling LED lights. You know, you could buy LED lights because it saves money, but a lot of people buy LED lights because it's green, right? So we're doing a proposal for, just to give you some perspective, we're doing a proposal. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty big warehouse. It's, about two, it's 280,000 square feet, which is pretty big. We're doing all their lights. We're changing them from that lighting to LEDs. Now, these lights all produce CO2. You guys know what CO2 is? Carbon dioxide, right? It's bad for the environment. Every one of these lights presides that, right? If we, in this building, if we changed all the lights from fluorescent to LED, it would be the same thing as taking 180 cars off the street. Same thing, right? Okay. Some people aren't going to give a shit about that, right? Some people, that could be a big deal. Like, this, I'm working with Bosch. You guys heard Bosch, like the tool, Bosch Tools, and yeah, this huge company. So I'm working with Bosch. And Bosch has, they pay their people. Part of their bonus is they've got to save CO2. So every, these managers of these plants and stuff, they have to figure out a way to save CO2 every year. So what's a great way to do that? Put LED lights in. So when I go talk to Bosch, they're saving money, obviously, but that's not the main reason they're buying it. They're buying it because it saves CO2. So when you segment your market for benefits sought, I could, I could say, I tell you what, I'm only going to call on companies that are completely green. And that's what they really care about. And I'm going to segment the market that I call on only on companies that are really into green. And I'm going to target my whole presentation. Yeah, you're going to save money. But guess what's really important is you took 180 cars off the street every year. So benefits sought means when you sell a product, the same product, I can sell that product to Bosch and talk about how green it is. I get my little car and go across the street and talk to another customer. They, could care, they couldn't care less about green. All they care about is money. Same products, same, work, you know, same type of building. So there's benefits sought is if you base your segmentation on what you're selling, based on why somebody's buying it. Then the last thing is usage rate. Usage rate means you segment the market based on how much people buy. So you, you have a, we're gonna talk about this again down the road in this class, but it sounds like you, you know, do you wanna segment your market? You wanna sell to a market where you can sell the most? Yes or no? No. Depends. It's one of those depends questions. 
Because what do you really want to do? Do you want to sell the most or make the most, right? So maybe you don't want to sell a lot to the biggest market. What you want to do is you want to identify, say, rich people. I'm just making this up. Rich people. And you know you can jack up the price on whatever service it is. Dog training. Let's talk about dog training. Anybody in here do dogs? You know, if you go into business, you want to do two things. You want to sell to rich people or people with dogs. Those are the only businesses you should be into. My wife's psycho. Psycho. She's nuts. She's been doing it for 20 years. My wife hasn't worked in 35 years. But she, she works 50 hours a week volunteering for dogs. So, you know, we spend a ton of money on dogs and stuff like that. It's like, why would you, why would you do that? Because, you know, you can, you can raise the price of dog. I'm just making this up. Rather than pets, I'm going to focus on dogs, people. Yeah, maybe I'll make, there'll be less people interested than total pets, but I can jack up the price. I know who I'm talking to. I've got the resources to do it. I ended up and make more money. So usage rates, I mean, most of the time you want to sell where you can go to people, the segment of the market you can sell the most, but not always. And all these luxury, you know, Rolex, when Rolex said they were going to come out with a watch, how come they didn't come out with a watch that cost 200 bucks? They could have sold a shitload of them. But they didn't do that. They came out of a watch that cost five grand. Less watches, more profit. Got it? I'm looking at you. But has everybody got that? Okay. You know it's time to leave when you start to sweat. <laughs> Let's get into this stuff too much. All right. Any questions? I'm taking I'm getting to you guys online in a second. How do I do that again? I got, I'll get to you guys in the line in a second. I got just a couple classes in person. We'll get out of here. Yes, sir. Price, yeah. Or savings, yeah. When you talk about core competencies, it's core competencies of company. So my core competency has got nothing to do with that. My core competency for LED lights is that I have main, I represent multiple manufacturers. I install them and do financing. The core competency is we do it all. What we talked about today is how you market the products or who you sell them to. So it's two different things. Core competency has to do is what, what are you good at in your company? Okay. Good. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, you don't know baseball. Okay, we're going to go through it again. In case nobody was, some of you that's not in this class, you're going to be next time. We're going to do this next class again, and you're going to ask that question. Any other questions? People online, you guys got any questions? Wow, it's 8.15 or 9.15. I've never done this, I don't think. I'm going to turn into a, what do you turn into, a pumpkin? Shelly Bruton, nice. No, okay. Does anybody, <laughs> does anybody have any questions, you guys, online at all? I'm sorry I went so late tonight. Have a, have a great weekend, and, and I'll see you Monday.